from Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native tongue of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. <coughs> then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. And thanks, thanks be to God. God. Creatures both small and great. Spirit, and they are created, and so you renew the face of the earth. 
May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. 
You also are to testify because you have been moved me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. <clears throat> about sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak who, whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, and every action of all our lives be always acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. <coughs> having a deacon here makes me do a lot of the work. <laughs> I really appreciate Francis even more. If you look through the Bible, you find that St. Paul wrote some beautiful and some powerful words and phrases. Just one example, maybe the best known, is he wrote the, the famous love chapter from 1 Corinthians. You know, love is patient, love is kind, so on. And then he's Describing a condition we can never fully achieve. Paul presents love as, a, as an unattainable but highly desirable goal. Paul has a number of other famous and powerful segments. Well, today's lesson from Romans is seldom listed among the most powerful. And I think that's a mistake. The use of it today in particular, the day of Pentecost, the day we remember being gifted with the Holy Spirit makes it particularly powerful. The, the linkage between the gifting of the Holy Spirit and Romans exists in Paul's image that the world is groaning like a woman in labor. Now, apologies to the mothers. Obviously, I have never been in labor and experienced those pains. But I have attended four births and sat in the waiting room for three others, so I have at least a tiny bit of appreciation for the experience. I know how, how stressful it can be in the waiting room for the father. Yet it was even more stressful being in the birthing room. I, I, I so wanted to rush in and fix things. I so wanted to hurry up the process. Not as much as she wanted to hurry up the process, but in English, Paul's phrases have a, a bit of a confused tone. You, you get the sense as you read it of something that's already been accomplished and something yet to be accomplished. He says that we and all of creation are groaning until now. But then he goes on to say, we will continue to grow inwardly while we await adoption into the kingdom of God. The sense we, we get from that is, is something that's been obtained yet not fully present. The labor to birth of this new creation has begun, but it's not complete. We are in a, the midst of a new creation being born, and as such, we have both the pain still to suffer and the frustration of the delay. Like, like parents-to-be, Paul says we wait with hope. Not hope for something that has already arrived, because that would not be hope. But hope for something still to come. But then Paul says something that I think is a mistake. Paul says we wait with patience. As I talk to people about waiting for God, I, I, I seldom hear the sense of patience. 
Sometimes people will be mellow and relaxed, waiting for God to act. But, but most of the time, most of us are anxious and impatient. Although this, this waiting certainly applies to specific circumstances, a, a cure for a disease, a, a new job, a, a better life, for example, Paul's words actually apply better when we see them in a more general way. Rather than focusing on our individual needs and desires, we hear Paul talk about all of creation, all people, and all of creation that is not perfect, so we wait impatiently for the day of God's kingdom to arrive. We wait for this, this future event, but can at the same time take advantage of that which has already been accomplished. Jesus has already come into the world, and although the, the final implications of that have not yet been realized, we already have the beginning of the change. The book we are studying on, on Wednesday nights explains it this way. We affirm that Jesus is uniquely related to God, fully reveals the nature of God, and connects us to God in a way no other person can. So we, we already have the opportunity to connect to God in a special and direct way. We already have an opportunity that did not exist before and would not exist without him. The final complete connection to God is still to come, but we, we have the opening chapters available to us even now. And this relates to Pentecost because it is through the Holy Spirit we have the existing opportunity and the hope, the faith in the future. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Truth, which will guide us into all truth. Now, as you're thinking about this, please don't get hung up or much less disturbed by the different roles of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do not worry about where, where Jesus' ministry ends, for example, and the Holy Spirit begins. Those are, are, are less than unimportant points. They are, are distracting and potentially destructive di disagreements. Sometimes that we find that rewording it might help. The bishop frequently uses the blessing, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer. Those are role descriptions which help, but even then, if just a couple minutes of thought, you begin to see the overlap between them. Don't worry about the boundaries. It's all God's work, and that's all that matters. So on the, the first Pentecost, and, and, and Pentecost was and is a Jewish festival, Jewish holiday known as the Feast of Weeks. On that day, we hear that the Holy Spirit came to the apostles in a powerful and dramatic way. Last week, I... I ask if such an experience, what, what some people call a mountaintop experience, is required for a person to be a Christian. We agree that it is not necessary despite what some people will tell you. And, and one of the reasons it's not necessary is that we can be touched by the Holy Spirit many times. We can be empowered, energized, ex excited, sent out by God many times in our lives. And each of those times can be a, a dramatic experience or something calm and quiet. But it's important to notice what the Holy Spirit did on the first Pentecost day. The Holy Spirit provided the apostles with the gift of communication so they could be understood. The Holy Spirit didn't do something showy just to be showy. The Holy Spirit did not do something miraculous just to show off and make a scene. The Holy Spirit did what was necessary so that the ministry, in this case the ministry of preaching, could be effective. So expect the same results in your life. Actually, you probably already have the necessary gifts. So the need is simply to accept and acknowledge them. The Holy Spirit was provides what is necessary to accomplish the ministry that has been appointed to each of us individually. 
In fact, one way to understand the ministry that God has in mind for us is to begin by acknowledging the various gifts we have to offer to God. These include our, our talents, they include our, our skills, our experiences, our training, everything we can put at the foot of God and tell God to take use of. All of them are the Holy Spirit's gifts. Once we acknowledge that, we can, we can ask what ministries are effective with those gifts. It's as if we were to look into a tool, into a workman's toolbox and, and see that he has a, a pipe wrench and a plunger, and we would know that what he was about to do had something to do with plumbing. In a similar way, our toolbox of gifts can help us understand what ministries God has in store for us. The words Peter spoke are, are very relevant to our understanding of our personal ministry. Peter told the crowd that the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh, on, on everyone. The Holy Spirit is not something given to a select few. The manifestations of the Holy Spirit are, are not parlor tricks to amaze our friends. When the Corinthians apparently had those attitudes, Paul corrected them very strongly, emphasizing that everyone received the gifts and they were given for the benefit of everyone. As I was reading Peter's sermon, I was struck by three of the words he used. He talks about visions, dreams, and prophecies. Paul says all people will be involved in these. Think about that and think about how it applies to us today. People see see visions and dreams of a, of a better world, a better life, how, how, how important they are. Each advancement in human condition happened because someone had a dream. Someone had a, a vision of what a better world would look like. It could be something as simple as a, as a vision of a better breakfast cereal product. Or it could be a vision of a program to end homelessness. Everything starts with the vision. So when God promises that day you will receive them, that's important. And the way we react to this is twofold. First, we need to be alert to the visions we may have. Don't downplay the importance when something comes to mind, even if it seems silly and impractical. Most great ideas seem silly and impractical when first discussed. <clears throat> Be willing to take a step out of the unknown and test your vision. Find out if it is from God. Second, listen to the visions and the dreams proclaimed by other people. <coughs> and again, don't be too quick to call them silly or impractical. Maybe, maybe they are. But maybe deep down there is some seed of greatness within that vision. When, when listening to yourself and others, Consider the possibility that God is involved. That <clears throat> puts an entirely different perspective on our considerations. The possibility that the Holy Spirit at that moment is working through us. The other part of Peter's sermon that struck me was the promise that people would prophesy. Remembering that means to explain the inevitable results from current actions. Prophecy can be important. Of course, knowing the difference between true prophecy and one person's conjecture can be difficult. I read a newspaper article this week which discussed how virtually all the economists had prophesied that gasoline prices would be a benefit to the economy, only to discover that the lower gasoline prices actually hurt the economy. Help <laughs> us, but hurt the broader economy. Truth prophecy versus conjecture versus guesswork. Again, consider the possibility of the Holy Spirit's involvement when things more important than gasoline prices are being discussed. Consider the possibility that the Holy Spirit is speaking through us to our society, speaking through the mouths of, of us and of various people. One of my favorite poets is songwriter Paul Simon. His classic, Sounds of Silence, includes the line, 
the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and tenement halls. I thought about that as I thought about the, the events in many American cities over the past few months. It's certainly worth asking if, if Paul Simon had it right and if, and if as Peter preached, even the least respected in our society are speaking prophecy. So we wait as a woman waits in labor. We wait for the visions and the dreams to become clear. We wait for the prophecies to be made known. We wait, but we wait not just with hope, but with faith that the best is yet to come. We may be groaning in frustration because it seems as if no improvements are being made. But Pentecost tells us God is involved. And if God is involved, then all will be well. Amen. 